February 1st, 2017. I'm in the Moon Rocks book again. Page 52. The speculating, of course, had been going on for some time already, as the PET members, the people who examined the Moon Rocks, were no more innocent of ideas than anybody else. Dr. Brett had his predictions locked away in a desk drawer. Dr. William Greenwood, a lanky geologist from Idaho, was saying that he wasn't expecting any surprises whatsoever when the boxes were opened. Those are the boxes that carry the moon rocks. For he believed that most of the rocks and dust from the moon would turn out to be chemically similar to, and in some cases identical with, rocks on Earth. He said he expected to find two types of volcanic rocks. Pyroxenite, rich in pyroxene minerals, and dunite, rich in a mineral olivine. And olivine, as a crystal, is a little green crystal. Both came from deep within the Earth's crust and mantle, and they could well come from the deep within the moon's interior, too, where Dr. Greenwood believed many of the same processes occurred. When the boxes were opened, he expected to look closely at any fine particles, for he believed that pyroxene and olivine, if they were on the moon's surface, would most likely have been blasted there when the deeper craters were formed. And the things that had blasted were likely to be in the form of small particles. He would not, of course, ignore larger rocks, for pyroxene and olivine could have found their way to the surface in lava flows. Though Dr. Greenwood expected the moon's rocks to be chemically similar to the Earth's, he cautioned that those which cooled on the surface could be structurally different. For, as little, no for little was known about the coalescing of molten rock in vacuum. Some lunar lavas might be frothier than they are on Earth, and some rock crystals might be bigger than they are here. A note there, little was known about the coalescing of molten rock in vacuum. Yeah, they're supposed to build planets out of this method. Which brings me to notice that they don't know how planets are formed, and this book was written in 1970. So they're accepting theories in planet formation of rocks melting out of space in vacuum when they don't even know what to expect on the moon. That that just shows you they if you have a literal if you have a metaphorical vacuum of theory and you have scientists looking at it, they're always going to fill it up with something. Okay, They're not going to allow them to not have any theory or any hypothesis about what's going on. They're always going to fill something up with it. So regardless if they don't know what they're talking about, they're going to say something, even though it might be complete bullshit. Uh, like that one saying, nature abhors a vacuum. It'll always fill in something if it can. The geologists are going to be in for an awful jolt when they find the moon isn't volcanic in the way the Earth is, Dr. Ure said before the astronauts came back. Quote, I keep telling these geologists to let their imaginations go. Most geologists tended to think the moon was or had once been hot, by which they meant hot lava internally for rock to be molten. A hot moon would have or had or once have had a molten core and presumably also some sort of layering analogous to the mantle and crust of the Earth. Cold mooners, as they were known at the Space Center, didn't believe the moon was absolutely cold, just that it wasn't hot enough to internally melt rocks. A cold moon could be well homogeneous, unlayered all the way through. Homogeneous means the same all the way through. Uh, geologists tended to be hot mooners because all their experience had been with the Earth, a hot planet, and when they looked through a telescope at the moon, they tended to interpret what they saw in the light of that experience, so they were biased. They saw a variety of volcanic craters and, indeed, compared lunar craters with Mauleo and other volcanic calderas on Earth with a popular line of study. Conversely, Cold mooners tended to be astronomers, physicists, and chemists, men who were used to dealing with weights and speeds of, vault of bodies falling through the space, such as meteors making impact craters on the moon, and with such theoretical matters as how much heat a body of a certain size and composition would generate. There were, of course, departures from this pattern. Dr. Ure, a chemist with a leaning towards physics, believed that when the rock boxes were opened, they would contain a good deal of smashed, impacted material, and he was quite indignant about a report that some geologists, hot mooners no doubt, 
had told the astronauts to leave meteoritic material behind. As cold mooners believed most of the surface features of the moon were made by impacts, they regarded such instructions very dimly. In this argument over whether the moon was hot or cold, with the geologists more or less on one side and the theoretical scientists on the other, the hybrid species such as geochemists and, and geophysicists all often found themselves in the middle. A big area for between a hot moon and a cold moon, there was a whole spectrum of warm, lukewarm, and tepid moons. The distinctions were further blurred by time, for it was possible to believe that the moon had been hot at one time of its birth and still be a cold mooner, whereas many hot mooners in good standing believe the moon to be volcanically quiet now. At the Space Center, geologists outnumbered physicists and chemists in the same way the engineers outnumbered them. The geologists felt that the hot moon was in the ascendancy and they could be quite scathing about cold mooners. While Apollo 11 was on its way home, one geologist said of Thomas Gold, the astrophysicist who was a ver ver vociferous cold mooner, or, um, I think that word means he believed it with everything he had in his mind, um, how would he like it if I began telling him about the stars? A point of view which overlooked the fact that up until quite recently, before the geologists were confident of getting their hands on it, the moon was considered a heavenly body. And this is in parentheses. Mr. Gold, who believed the moon to be totally unlike the Earth, remarked later that he didn't favor geologists study the moon any more than he favored them studying the sun. Uh, a few notes here. Hopefully you got all that. The problem with what I see going on here is that there was so much compartmentalization. If you just had people only looking at the moon based off their prior experiences and what they believed it to be true, you know, you would have different ideas, obviously, because they all had their own backgrounds and their own bias and what they study. So that is what they thought it was. And unfortunately, you see it right there, is if you have a different educational background, you look at nature with different eyes. So nature is doing one thing, and your ba educational background will telling you it's doing another thing. And this is why it's so hard to get theory out there, is because they'll look at you and say, well, are you a physicist? Are you a geophysicist? Are you a geologist? What are you? Because this is this kind of problem, and there's no possible way you could understand this, yet that's just compartmentalization. That's just them moving along inside of their in-groups. Because nature isn't compartmentalized, unfortunately. It's not separated into, okay, nature's only going to show geologists what, they all, what all they learned in school. And then the Earth is going to be like, okay, Earth, stop being a volcano now and get ready for the, for, the, for the theoretical scientists to step in to study you in the way they're used to studying you. It doesn't work like that. Nature is a single construct. So you can automatically see off the bat that they have differences based off their educational backgrounds. Yet, nature, there's only going to be one way, one truth to the matter. So there's that. Also, I noticed there's missing information here. How did the rocks chemically combine from simpler molecules and given they were once even separated elements before they were molecules? Now we know this for a fact, it's observed, because the, re the, the majority of observed astrons, which are, you know, stars, are hot enough so that the elements are separated. Yet, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tragedy because you have Mr. Gold here who remarked that he didn't favor geologists studying the moon any more than he favored studying the sun. Well, the sun is a young moon. The sun is a very, very, very young moon. It's so freaking young. It's so freaking big. It has all, the majority of its mass still. It's really, really hot. And it hasn't, been, hasn't aged enough to where it can form molecules yet. And these molecules are formed in larger conglomerates called minerals, which are then larger con con conglomerates called rocks. And they're sitting here holding these rocks, not realizing that they were once completely separated and ionized at one point. But uh, that completely skips over them. And it's funny because geologists have just as much right 
to study the stars as I do the Earth itself, because the Earth is the ancient star, which is really, really ironic. And here's another one of those points in this theory where I'm realizing that uh, I see these astronomers and, and scientists, it's like they're walking along a trail and they stub their toe on a rock. They think it's a rock, say, oh, fuck it. And they kick the rock to the side and keep on going and they nurse their toe because they stubbed it really hard. Not realizing the rock that they threw to the side was a giant brick of gold. If they would have just closed their, their, their bias, opened their mind and realized that nature was trying to show them something really important, they, it would have made sense to them. But that's, that's one of those instances. Alright, um, yeah, and all this is possible because it's a change in worldview. These astronomers and geologists... They all believe that the Earth and the stars are separate constructs, that they're very, very different. But as we all know, they're not inside of stellar metamorphosis. All right, y'all. Later.